Thanks so much for having me here. I always love uh, coming to Michigan, and now that my good friend Monica is here, uh, it's even more of a pleasure. Yesterday, when Monica opened the conference, she talked about the not-so-happy disconnect between a track of environmental stewardship and the track of formal design. And uh, she posed a question as to whether form could become the agent of these other types of tracks. And this really resonated with me because this is my two areas. You know, I have an area that I'm associated with uh, called environmental design, sustainable design, green design, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then I have an area of smart materials, uh, advanced technologies on the other end of it. And these things really are treated as if they're two distinct and not compatible areas. Uh, for my classes, my seminars in smart materials and light technologies, nobody who's the slightest bit interested in sustainable design will even shop the class. They won't show up for the first class. They think this kind of class is frivolous. Uh, by the same token, those who uh, are interested in, the designers who are interested in smart materials will sell their firstborn to get a slot in the seminar, but at the same time beg me to please let them out of my onerous environmental design class. And one might wonder why I deal with these two subjects, but for me, these are not subjects. Uh, they're domains of application. And the subject that I'm interested in is the one uh, that is inherent or needed for both of them, and it fundamentally is understanding how things work, particularly how the laws of physics are made manifest at the smallest scale. So what's very interesting for me, and I, I'm going to take uh, Monica quite literally a stream of consciousness talk, and so this will be stream of consciousness and some episodes uh, that I'm going to populate this with. But I was asked about two months ago to join a team at Yale that uh, for me is this opportunity to finally bring these two things together. Uh, the, um, what am I doing? What am I doing? Right, okay. Uh, the uh, Yale has one of the world's largest private collections of things. Uh, the Peabody Museum has 12 million artifacts. Uh, this is uh, something from the, uh, what the, the conservators call the stuffed animal warehouse, uh, where every Yale alum who's ever shot anything uh, has donated it to the school. Uh, but 12 million objects in the Peabody Museum, 185,000 works of art just in the Yale Art Gallery, and I'm not including the British Center, uh, the collection of musical instruments, uh, the Beinecke, you know, just unbelievable collection of artifacts, the vast majority of which has been stored in basements, warehouses. Uh, the rhinoceros had lost all of its fur because it was in a moldy basement. Uh, the collection of uh, musical instruments is stored in different, uh, a variety of different buildings. S uh, Baroque harpsichords are stacked on top of each other in an old boathouse. Um, 18th century complete house uh, since 1920 has been in the football team's field house basement. These things have been all over the place. And, uh, you know, part of what people have found, of course, I, I imagine people have read about this in the news, and that in just even trying to catalog what they had, they found this unknown before Velasquez. Um, and obviously not in very good condition because it too was in some kind of moldy basement. So Yale has bought an entire campus. Uh, it's called the West Campus. It's a former Bayer uh, pharmaceuticals plant. And the idea there is that we are building a state-of-the-art uh, storage, preservation, conservation facility for all of these artifacts. And the vast majority of them are moving out uh, to this location. And so the charge that, that I've been given on this is that how can we deal with the latest technology the highest state of the art in preservation and conservation while simultaneously having this be the most energy efficient facility we can find. And having that charge of sort of pushing both of these to the limits has really been you know, quite fascinating for me. And so some of the things that we put forward in the proposal are ones in which instead of thinking about artifacts being housed either in their own protective cases, many of the uh, more precious artifacts 
do have their own condition cases uh, or uh, the clean room type of technology for larger spaces, can each artifact create its own thermal zone so that it drives its conditions within its boundary layer a centimeter or so away? We don't have to worry about any of the rest of the building as long as the artifact is driving its own conditions. And the other thing we're trying to develop is a means by which uh, we can control light at the wavelength level on the artifact so we don't damage the artifact, but create a visual field that the conservator has full ability uh, to work in. And so this for me has been fascinating because what should be, we're also using as late technology as we can find. At the same time, we're dealing with these extremely old artifacts. Uh, this is one that I saw last week in a conservator's office. Uh, I brought this up because there was some references yesterday to plywood uh, as well as to steaming wood. Uh, this is plywood uh, from the third century. It has three plies of poplar sandwiched between canvas and resin, and its cylindrical shape comes from the fact that it was steamed into shape. So many of the things that we think, of course, belong to the 20th century or later indeed are technologies that have existed or approaches that have existed for centuries, and, and this is actually a fairly rare um, artifact that uh, steaming, particularly in a shape like this, really isn't well known of, of having occurred uh, this early on. So given all that, where does one go with this? And I have found that in, in trying to move forward and understanding what the next step is, it's, and this sounds like a cliche, it's really helpful to go back, and this is a good example of going back. So, episodes. So, uh, a couple of years ago, on my way to Abu Dhabi, um, in the in-flight magazine, uh, this article about the Microsoft home of the future, and you know, you can read the description of it, you know, as you approach, the lights come on, you hear a click as the door unclicks, the door swings open to you. And this was very, very familiar to me because when I first started teaching smart materials, we looked a lot at the Philips home of the future. You know, at the front door, she is recognized, you know, the door opens for her. And of course, that was 10 years before, in 1997. And because I do like science fiction, uh, I was very familiar with this project the Tron hyper-intelligent building from the moment that the employee arrives, you know, the uh, systems recognize him, open the door to him, 1987. So you're looking at a span of nearly three decades across two centuries and the description of what constitutes a smart environment or a smart building has not changed at all. And I find this sort of stunningly unimaginative on our parts. Uh, that we continue to define, define these things through the things that we know. Uh, we envelop them in the things that we know rather than really challenging what the idea should be of something that's a smart environment. And I want to pose to you that this, this work that we're, we're trying to develop for uh, this conservation facility is trying to put forward a definition of what a smart environment is. In this case, it's a smart environment that might be determined or centered on the rhinoceros I'm equally as interested in an, an environment that is determined and dynamic in terms of the human body. So next episode. You're going to notice, hopefully recognize a number of the buildings up here. Uh, and understand when I say selected projects, there's two pages of these selected projects all done uh, by a single individual. So pretty much every great iconic building uh, in the United States and as well as in, in other countries uh, done by this man, Richard Kelly, uh, a great lighting designer. Uh, I teach a course in lighting technology and I was dismayed that I really was not familiar with Richard Kelly until I was asked to write uh, for the catalog accompanying an exhibition and I was asked to write about technology. You know, that, that it was a historian who asked me, so technology was something apparently very small uh, in his mind as opposed to something very, very large. But if you look at his contemporaries from uh, William Richardson, Abe Fetter, Edison Price, and then Richard Kelly, this is in his Philip Johnson phase, uh, he really stood alone. And there was an article that they were questioned about technology, and all three of his contemporaries talked about the introduction of fluorescent lighting and how fluorescent lighting had completely changed the way that one designed, completely changed the way that one thought about light in a space. Kelly came up instead with a total of 
31 different technologies, of which fluorescent lighting was but one of them. This is one of my favorites uh, to even find sort of a nice feature uh, that a particularly unpleasant type of light was at least helpful and flattering uh, for green plant life. You know, these are just a handful of the technologies for electric lighting, similar type of collection uh, for daylighting. Uh, we're going to come back to this one in a second. Uh, but for him, these were not about the technology writ large. It really was about the technology as instrumental, because this is what, for him, he designed with. He understood light in terms of its intensity, its uh, brightness, its diffusion, uh, its spectral, uh, its uh, spectral profile. You know, for him, it was the movement of light, the qualities of light. The technologies were only instrumental in creating that. The, the technology was simply tools to this end. So coming back to that, that uh, little part I highlighted on, um, on daylight, uh, this is an interesting quote of his where he talks about the fact that one only understands what's in the field of view based on adjacencies, and we know this as a zero crossing. Uh, but what's interesting is zero crossing does not enter, you know, into uh, the, uh, uh, the knowledge of cognitive uh, psychology into, until 1971, so 20 years before he was fully cognizant of and fully aware of this idea of zero crossing. And you can see it in buildings that he designed. So here's Seagram's. And I'm just going to walk you through this. This is his sketch for Seagram's. And what you notice is that the daylighting uh, coming from the glazing uh, on the left, on the right, uh, the uh, uh, a, a, a luminous ceiling next to that. And then if you look at the actual installation, it continues to step down. Uh, for almost anybody else in lighting design, this is counterintuitive. Uh, the fact that he stages light all the way through and that the interior is going to be the darkest. Uh, well, well uh, sort of documented studies have shown that the more daylighting a modern building has, the more electric lighting it uses. And it has to do with the fact that uh, when you're indiscriminate about daylighting, uh, you create uh, situations of contrast that are so difficult to see with, you're forced to turn on your light. He knew that. He wrote about the fact that if you want to have full glazing, you're going to have to deal with finding a way to stage it down. He stages it all the way across in this space. It's really quite remarkable uh, to see. So here's my next episode. And I, I'm sure most of you are familiar uh, with this marvelous um, exhibition that took place in the late 60s and 70s an incredible collection of people uh, from the artists who were involved to the uh, teams, the companies they were teamed with, uh, the idea is what would happen with these artists if they could be teamed with some of the great technology companies of the time. And of course, the best thing uh, was the consultant for all of that. Uh, the most complete archives on this are the archives written by Irwin and Terrell. And uh, they were sent to work with a manufacturer of, of uh, Jet, well, turbine, uh, jet turbines for, for um, the aerospace industry. And uh, when Irwin started this, he sent a list out of the things that he would be interested in working on. And again, it's interesting to see that even back um, in the 60s, he was talking about things that we consider to be quite modern by today's standpoint, chemiluminescence, electroluminescence, uh, but you know, a whole variety of different types of materials that interacted with light. It was Wirtz, um, the, the uh, aircraft guy, he introduced them to, uh, the, first of all, the idea of the anechoic chamber, a sensory deprivation uh, where all uh, sound is removed and the body has a very difficult time placing itself. Um, he also introduced them to uh, the Gansfeld effect. And just because I always like to include something helpful uh, for people in the audience, you can make your own Gansfeld effect. At least this ping pong ball manufacturer even says, shows you how to cut the ping pong ball so you too uh, can experience snow blindness. But all of these together, uh, you know, trying to understand how the body responded, how one saw, um, how one understood sequences of different types of perceptual experiences. You know, the end product, like many of the products that came out of this thing, was not terribly interesting. Uh, they, they did a conference. So they hoped they were going to design an environment. The result was it was a conference. Uh, scrim is on the back. Uh, so they did use Scrim to try to even out, create a little bit of a Gansfeld effect. 
um, uh, and the floor was covered in cardboard, trying to be a little bit of an anechoic chamber. But in those archives, this is the sort of wonderful statement from Terrell, uh, that technology is merely a means, not an end. Uh, and I think this is one of the points that's really critical, is that our, as enamored as we are with many of these technologies, it, they are indeed instrumental. Okay, last episode. I have one second left. Uh, uh, Frederick uh, Wilson, who tragically died in March, uh, introduced me to magic, uh, 19th century magic. And uh, he put on this marvelous exhibition, and he wanted to talk about 19th century magic as being completely different uh, from magic before, uh, that it really was about understanding physics, really was about understanding things, how things worked. Uh, this is a, a Ricky Jay interpretation of a pop popular 19th century magic trick. Uh, it's called the blow book. Uh, the idea is that you know, the, the magician shows the blank pages, blows on the pages, and then uh, the, all the images magically appear. Of course, you can see my, my hands there and the fact that there's carefully done thumb indentations to make it happen. But, you know, it's no less a precursor to our use of thermochromics today. And indeed, our use of thermochromics really has not changed much from this initial conception, uh, which was not about the technology or foregrounding the technology. It was about finding a way to instrumentalize and create the effect. What mattered was the effect, not the technology at all. Last two slides. So when I think about um, uh, the way that we typically approach design, and this is now just a, a swath of radiation, uh, that the need or the desire is going to be at the le level of the body. We take action uh, at the scale of a building. The impact of that action is felt, uh, depending upon the systems are used generally or regionally, the consequences, of course, are the ones that are, are longer uh, in, in the, uh, the future and, and much more widespread. Uh, what I would rather that we would think about is rather than sort of uh, focusing on the building, focusing on the artifacts, focusing on the materials, focusing on the technologies, actually focus on the phenomenon. And so a different map, and this is a map that deals with the basic physics of how things work, how one actually creates behaviors or creates these smart environments or these discrete environments, the fact that we want these discrete environments to interact with the body and what the physiological response is because our ultimate end is this. And so I see architecture not as being uh, the building in terms of action, but actually sort of operating in this middle ground between how we might make a phenomenological behavior, uh, uh, how we might manipulate a phenomenological behavior in order to have some kind of action directly on the body.